most of you guys know, I am um, Andrew Kamal. I'm the medical director here for the last year for Bible Hospice and Palliative Care. I um, have been doing full-time hospice and palliative for several years now, so this has been a joy. It's wonderful to work with this great organization and great, great community here, small doctor community, but wonderful, wonderful group. So um, I do not have any financial disclosures in unfortunately. If anyone has any suggestions on that, I'm open to taking that. But, um, so we're going to get into a little bit of some of the issues of addiction and misuse in our society. Um, and the concept of dealing with both pain and addiction, really talking, some is going to be a little bit more theoretical. I'm talking about how the opiates work on the brain, because that's really essential to knowing how and how to use these medications appropriately, um, strategies to, to use these most effectively for the least risk and harm, and some how we deal with problems as they arise and they will arise as you know. So, going briefly, just an interesting history. Uh, back in the 70s, as some of you all may remember, strong opiates were really not used much at all. Even in cancer pain, they were really used quite, quite little. And actually, interested me going back in research how much hospice and palliative experts, particularly some of the founders of the field, um, Lucy Saunders, Robert Foytras, and Catherine Foley in New York, were essential in really studying how, to, how can we use morphine in cancer pain? How can we use some of these other, other medications in ways that are effective? And they and some others were gotten together by the head of the WHO to set out these WHO pain guidelines, the pain ladder that you may be familiar with. And that really began a major revolution. And a number of other guidelines policies began to change over time because of recognition that severe pain was being severely undertreated or not using a very effective class of medications. So what we see is, until, they say, in 1986, there was 30 milligrams of morphine per capita per year in the United States. That was, that was all that we were using in that. Then see, whoa, and, and it's kind of leveled up. It's currently 650 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent per year per capita. That's quite a more than 20 fold increase. And in fact, in this country, opiates are now our one, number one prescribed med class, medication class. And even though we're less than 5% of the world's population, we are now using 80% of the world's opiates. Go US. Um, and there's you know, certainly a lot of good in that. Um, un un unfortunately, they've also seen a number of other problems. And there's several other graphs that I can give you that show very similar types of increases. This one happens to be an intentional drug overdose death. Most of, it, most of that increase means increase in opiate deaths. Um, and at this point, prescription opiate abuse is actually more common than marijuana here. Um, it is considered the new gateway drug. A lot of teenagers and others are using that, to kind of, and then they may start using harder stuff, which is kind of interesting because opiates used to be considered a harder stuff. Um, and we think of a lot of this as being maybe someone going out and doctor shopping and then selling it on the street, but most of the time, most of the misuse that's happening, most of the non-medical use, which means these are the people, they're not getting it prescribed themselves, they're taking someone else's medicine, they're still just getting it from one person, they're getting it from one doctor. And so there's, it's, it's not the, necessarily the doctor shoppers who are the problem. It's a lot of it is people who are getting medicine from one doctor. And, and this, there's a lot of quotes, I can give much more inflammatory quotes, but this is a really groundbreaking article that really looked at it in great in depth. Pain movement and the resulting increase in opiate prescription is directly correlated to the dramatic increase in opiate related deaths. These two are linked, which, if you look at the graphs, isn't especially surprising. Um, and if you look in the news, it's, it's all over the place. They're calling it an epidemic of prescription opiate abuse. Responsible for more fatal overdoses each year than cocaine and heroin combined. Third United Nations' fastest growing drug problem. It is a public health crisis. Um, wow. So, are you guys familiar with the opiate, long acting opiate remedy plan? Um, that's the risk evaluation management strategy. That's something that they put in place for certain very high risk drugs, such as Accutane, other things like that. We need to go through certain steps. Well, they. Um, the um, DA has, and FDA have actually required them to develop a risk management strategy for initially long-acting opiates. 
And um, I mean, this is some of the um, claims out there. It's threatened to remove long acting op opiates, um, and they're developing a term plan. And this can be, this, if this goes into effect, it would severely um, change practices. It came, they came out with a proposal, and it was rejected as being too soft, even though many, most people saw that as being too harsh and threatened. Wow. Okay, so we've got this plan that's seen as threatening and cutting use, uh, cutting use drastically, and it's rejected being too soft. Well, one of the reasons it was, one of the reasons I particularly agree with, is that it didn't address short Um But so we've got this major, we've got these major issues, and the government is coming in to try to look and say, hey, what do we need to do to fix this problem? Well, at least we're effectively treating pain, right? Chronic pain is no longer an issue because we've got all this opiate on board. Well, this is just from this month. We're in the pain epidemic. You know, 70 million Americans is sweat spread. Why aren't we taking it seriously? Um, this is New North, North Carolina last year. Um, chronic pain prevalence in New North Carolina rose from 3.9% in 1992, lower on that graph, to 10.2% in 2006. Whoa! That's, wait a minute, this is impairing low back pain. So it's not, so this is not saying they're needing medications for it. This is saying it's actually impairing their life, keeping them from going to work despite all this increase in medication. That's not good. Another major panel with some excellent experts. Um, and this is, a, this is a little simplistic summary of this panel's recommendations, which are actually a lot of wonderful recommendations. But they say this epidemic of pain under treatment affects 70 million Americans. So they're saying this is we're severely under treating pain. Huh. That's not, that's a, it's just interesting. We've got people saying, wait a minute, we're, this is contributing to huge problems, and then we're still not treating pain. Well, we are at least treating cancer pain, right? Well, 2008, for you, one in two, nearly one in two patients with cancer are under treated. And how these different studies um, came up with that, this is a, this is a um, copy and review. They varied in how, but a lot of them, it was under use of opiates. We are not appropriately using enough opiates for these patients. Okay, now hold on here. Some people are saying we're not giving enough opiates. Some people are saying, wait, we've got too much. What, what's the deal here? What, how do we, how do we, you know, what do we do? Well, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this quote. Where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, what you see also depends on where you sit. And if you talk to the average palliative care doc, you're going to see patients who benefit tremendously from increased doses of opiates. You know, pain, many of the, uh, particularly the cancer pain, um, shortness of breath um, is something that low dose opiates can do wonders for. Um, it can dramatically improve quality of life, it can help people totally transform people's lives, help them sleep, it can, if you can treat their pain effectively, you can sometimes help with depression, anxiety, and we're seeing people really afraid of these medications and not using them when they need to, both physicians, families, patients. And so, average palliative care doctor, we're not using enough of these stuff meds. They clearly benefit when we use more. Now, you go and ask an addiction doctor, well, what are they seeing? They're seeing people, one after another, destroyed lives, careers, marriages destroyed, um, they're starting off with a legitimate prescription. And they say, oh, I like this. This helps me concentrate. This helps me, this gives me energy. This this really helps me, um, this helps me deal with some of my emotional issues. And then they start getting in trouble. Um, how much these people, they'll try to get off. And it, it, it is so difficult to get off. Getting off of these opiates is extremely difficult. And how many Doctor, if you start, if you go to a different doctor, they will tell you that they hear all the time about how easy it is to get some of these scripts if you know who to go to and what to say. And so, okay, we've got two very different perspectives. Um, and so one group is saying we're not using enough. One group is saying we're prescribing too much. Okay, well, let me give you just a couple quotes, and these are, um, I was going to give you more on both, but I'll get into some of those issues there. One side. It's just the addicts that are problem. It's not these patients. Those people out there, not my patients. Well, 
I'd like to say that's the truth. Unfortunately, it's not not that simple um, because there's it's not like you can draw a nice line. Pain is what the patient says it is, and it is how bad the patient says it is. Who's heard this before, people? Good. I, mean, I hope some of you have. That is, you know, dogma out there. And it is absolutely a true statement, as long as the patient's not lying to you. The fact is, though, um, actually, much more often, patients undertell pain. They describe, they say, oh, no, I'm not in pain, but they may be in 10 out of 10 discomfort. Well, they're in pain. They just are not describing it as an ache or something else. Um, but, obviously, some also say it's higher. So this is, it's what they experience is what pain is, by definition. It is not what they say it is necessary. Okay, this is another quote out there that's posed as absolute doctor. They have no upper limits on dose, no long term, no serious long term risk, and patients won't be done. Well, probably all three of those are wrong. Um, we, you know, generally the doses most people are using probably not significant. But if you're if generally getting above um, mid 100 oral morphine equivalent or 200 oral morphine equivalent. Probably not going to get a whole lot of benefit for most patients on that um, per day. That's daily dose. Um, long-term risks, those, there are some issues long-term that, that hadn't really been described as much. And patients will become addicted. Well, that depends. Um, depends on a lot of things. This is one that's specifically regarding the hospice-type patient that I've heard a few different places. But they're going to die anyway. Who cares if they're addicted? Let them be happy, right? That makes sense. Well, how many of you guys have really interacted with opiate addicts? And how many of you guys, how many of those addicts would you describe as being happy? <laughs> These are some of the most miserable people you will ever meet in your life. Um, opiate addiction is absolutely miserable. Um, uh, it, is a, it, it, it destroys lives. So opiates are good and bad. They are good, particularly the analgesic effect is key. And these are the most effective treatment for most physical pain, including a lot of neuropathic pain. They are essential in management of severe acute pain, of cancer pain, and of some chronic non pain. And we are often not treating people who need it. And, so, and we have an epidemic of pain. But, Particularly the issue of addiction issues, and as well as some other issues, is, is destructive. You've got to, it contributes to suffering, dysphoria, destroys a lot of families, a lot, a tremendous amount of cost, both direct and indirect, and direct and deaths. And they're not always effective and can cause some other problems. I'm not going to get into chronic pain treatment, that's a whole other issue. But we have an epidemic of abuse. So we have two issues here with opiates. So I'd like to talk about the two main effects. Obviously, constipation, there's plenty of other things, but the two main effects that people might actually take this for would be analgesia, which is obviously a good thing, and addictive effects, which are bad, right? Well, can you get one without the other? I've heard people argue that, well, it just helps people so they're happy enough so they don't, feel, they don't pain doesn't bother them anymore. Well, that's not actually accurate. It actually does decrease how much pain sensation is getting to their brain, and how that is that is perceived. Um, so, but are these are these separate effects? 